Okay, let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to, to this portfolio committee meeting of today. Um, honorable members, early this year, the committee took a decision to jointly invite both Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation and Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs to brief us about the initiative, namely the District Dis uh, Development Model. We are aware that this model has been violated in sele uh, selected municipalities already. We further agreed to invite the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation to brief us on the local government management improvement model and presidential hotline on cases reported during COVID-19 lockdown. Honorable members, all these briefings are as a result of our committee recommendations. Thank you very much. Welcome all to this meeting. We, we have received the following apologies before I get to the agenda of the day. We have received uh, an apology from Honorable Minister Mtembu, Honorable Minister uh, Zamini Zuma, and uh, Honorable Deputy Minister of Kokta, Honorable Babela, and uh, Honorable Deputy Minister Sway will leave before the meeting ends. We have also received an apology from Deputy Minister uh, Chau, who will join us late. And then we have an apology from Honorable Malomane, who is the member of our committee, uh, because he, there's a serious mishap in her family. So. <laughs> Who is, who is speaking now? It, it should be me speaking. Nobody must speak before I conclude the opening remarks. And we have also a, an apology from uh, Honorable Malule. Mastore, is there any apology that uh, has been sent through that I have uh, not uh, uh, noted? Uh, good morning, Chair and Honourable Members and colleagues. No, Chair, you've covered all, all the apologies. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I will therefore hand over to, to DPME to brief the committee. I don't know, uh, uh, Deputy Minister Swaya, before that, I think you, you must give us an opening overview of this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. And good morning to colleagues from GPME and, and COXTA. I just want to apologize. I'm on the road, so if I do the, the video, it, network might be a problem. Chair, we are very happy to, to come and, and brief the committee about the work which we, we continue to do. The DG will take us through just a, a, a few highlights is that, uh, Chair, after the president had went throughout the country, Eastern K, KZN and, and Limpopo, to launch the piloting of, of the district development model, we have seen uh, ministers and deputy ministers who are assigned to various districts also going to launch. For example, the minister was in Herigwala. On Friday, I will be in Skukune, and, and, and the committee will take you through in relation to other ministers who are deployed and deputy ministers to other districts in terms of how far are they. The other issue, Chair, is that in relation to the presidential hotline, you'll remember that when it was launched in 2009, you only had email 
and only calling which you could launch your complaint. We have successfully digitalized the presidential hotline. As we speak currently, we've got an app which we have launched, the Kaulesa app, which you can download on your phone, and then you are able to launch your complaint. We also have got a, a USSD number. This we did because it is important to ensure that we create all platforms for our people to be able to interact with us. I'm going to, to request that uh, the DG take us through. Thank you, Chair. You can take the platform, DG. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Members, uh, DM, and colleagues. Thanks once again for this opportunity for inviting the department to come and present to ourselves as a way of accounting for the work that we do on the three areas that uh, have been uh, referred to. Now, Chairperson, according to our agenda, the agenda that we have received from the committee, we will start with the presentation on the local government management improvement uh, model. And then that will be followed by discussions and then the DDM discussions and then the presidential hotline and the discussions will also follow after that presentation. So that being fine, Chair, I just want to make a few comments with regard to the first presentation, which is the local government improvement model. But by saying that government as a whole has recognized the need to work on the capacity of the state as a precondition for service delivery and effective e governance. So this issue is not only being discussed with respect to local government, but also at the national e government was assist with this e work together with DPSA and others on how best we build the capacity of the state because we can't talk about a developmental state when the state has no capacity to do what it's supposed to, to do. And I, I guess as time goes on, or from time to time, ourselves and DPSA, as well as others in this kit, will brief the committee on work that is being done at the national level to build the capacity of the state. So for the purposes of today, we're talking about the work that we're doing to support the local sphere of government by building the necessary capacity. Now, as DPMA, we are very much involved since with that e project of supporting local government to ensure that we have the necessary capacity for local government to deliver e services to our people. So we will be speaking to, to, to that, and the presentation is going to be led by Hassan Mohammed. And as indicated, after the presentation, we are going to take questions from the honorable members on, on this issue. And on that note, and with your permission, Chair, I ask Hassan Mahomet to commence with the presentation. Thank you. I think what we should do when he has uh, uh, presented, uh, we are not going to immediately engage in, uh, in discussions. You can, you can give us the, the the presidential hotline report, and then we discuss them together because we did receive uh, the, 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 the documents earlier. So, to, so that we must not waste much time. After the presentation of DPME, we must get the presidential hotline cases reported during COVID-19. And then discussions will follow thereafter. Thanks, Chairperson. With your permission, we'll do exactly that. Hassan? Um, uh, thank you, DG, and uh, good morning, honorable members and colleagues. Uh, I'm going to, um, of course, mindful of the fact that I've been given 20 minutes, um, um, keep within that kind of timeline. Um, so, I'm assuming that, of course, everybody has the presentation since it's not going to be flighted. But just to give people a sense of the points to be covered, um, there's um, the presentation will cover about 10 points. The, of course, um, just to remind people and give, uh, uh, especially those who are new to the portfolio committee, a background to this particular initiative. 
We also highlight the roles and responsibilities of key partners. This initiative is done jointly with partners at national, provincial, and of course, local level. Uh, we will take the uh, committee through to uh, through what the um, LGMM is about, uh, its concept, what it uh, is measuring, and so on, uh, and uh, the process. Uh, and then we'll go into the details of uh, the um, municipalities that we enrolled in that period and uh, the results are, uh, thank you, so here we are. If we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So that's where we are and we'll, we'll talk about the results and the um, enrollments there and then conclude. So in terms of background, the LGMM um, people will recall that it um, was a concept that um, we launched about five years ago, and that follows the uh, what what we did at national and provincial level called the management performance assessment tool. Uh, of course, the LGMM was tailored for local government uh, uh, conditions and needs, which were quite different, as you can imagine, from national and provincial. The, the idea and the concept and, and, and uh, the, the details around performance areas and so on were jointly developed by those parties, including DCOC National Treasury, SALGA, and key national departments such as water and sanitation, energy, refuge, I mean, uh, environment, and so on. And um, on the basis of that, uh, um, you know, the uh, it was it was agreed that this would be a valuable initiative uh, to identify municipal institutional vulnerabilities and performance gaps. Next um, slide, please. So the next slide starts to cover, which I won't spend too much of time on. As I said, this is an initiative with partners. Uh, can we move to the next slide? I'll continue while the um, slide catches up. Um, so, you know, as, uh, and I won't spend too much of time on this, but uh, of course, um, you know, there's the key responsibilities are important when you, particularly when you're working with uh, uh, key partners, so everybody understands their respective roles and contributions. Uh, so that's what the uh, DPME does uh, in relation to this initiative. Uh, provincial caucus, national departments have an important role, as I said, and municipalities themselves. I mean, the key in all of this is particularly the uh, 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 other departments. And the point about this is that once the assessments are released, uh, uh, all these departments have agreed to participate. They've also agreed that you'll see that point to utilize the results. And uh, as we go into the presentation, uh, that we'll see that that's one of the sort of problem areas that uh, uh, once the assessments are released, uh, you know, not much is done from the other partners in utilizing the LGMM results to inform the intervention and support strategies. Next slide, please. Just uh, quickly to run through, and this is what the DG has already touched on, just to give people a sense of what, what the focus and logic of the LGMM is. Uh, and the idea was derived from, from that uh, state uh, block at the top right-hand corner from the NDP. Uh, so the point is that, you know, we can't wave into existence uh, a developmental state. We have to uh, work hard at it. And the point about the uh, LGMM is that if, if you think about uh, uh, what municipalities are expected to deliver the results, then it's important for us to understand what is the operational and workplace capabilities that must exist in order to produce this result. And that's what the LGMM does. It, cons it considers and focuses on those operational and workplace capabilities of municipalities and see whether they exist in order to deliver the results. And it does that by analyzing uh, uh, the internal uh, uh, workings of the municipality. 
Next slide, please. Part of the discussion with uh, um, uh, the, our key partners that I mentioned earlier was to say, okay, you know, it's all very well that uh, we, we're saying that uh, municipalities, their internal workings and capabilities must uh, are important, but it was it's not just capabilities in general. So we uh, discussed at length, you know, in which areas must municipalities have those essential capabilities, and these are the key performance areas. And then we asked ourselves, if these are the key performance areas, then uh, um, uh, what at, you know what what must be the standard of performance? So you'll see that we have those six key performance areas, starting with, of course, planning, going on to service delivery, financial management, community engagement, and governance. Uh, next slide, please. Then um, the next slide just touches on, um, you know, then how are these key performance areas and the different uh, standards uh, assessed. And that just gives you a, 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 in a sort of robot or traffic light format, um, what, how the municipality is doing with level one being uh, uh, lacking the essential capabilities, uh, level two having some of those capabilities, but not sufficient. Level three is sufficient capability and level four is where the municipality is essentially innovating. Next slide, please. The, the algemum is, is of course underpinned by uh, 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 a very sort of uh, substantive process, um, which is described in the, in the next slide. We have the, uh, of, there's a, starting with the launch, the self-assessment, moderation, feedback, and review, and improve. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it sort of describes these uh, in a little more. So in the launch phase, as you can see, this is when we uh, would um, uh, discuss with our provinces which municipalities they would like to nominate to uh, and who will benefit from this initiative. Uh, and then uh, those municipalities are selected and uh, commitments are extracted from the MMM executive mayors that uh, they are prepared to participate and will apply their minds to this. Uh, then, of course, they are trained. Uh, following that, the municipality itself uh, does the assessment. Uh, it then reaches us and together with sector departments like water and sanitation, national treasury and others, we look at the assessment and we see whether the moderate, uh, whether the, uh, the results or the scores that they're given for those key performance areas and standards match the, the um, evidence that was there. And um, um, on the third basis, the municipality uh, uh, we send the moderated scores back and they're given an opportunity to review after which we finalize. And once the finalized scorecard is uh, sent to municipalities, signed off on, uh, then um, um, of course the improvement planning stage begins. Next slide, please. So just now we will just go into the, the uh, um, the, the municipalities we enrolled, there were 35 of them. That's how they distributed across the different provinces. Just to say that although they're 35 municipalities, you know, uh, to give a perspective of, uh, you know, what we're talking about in terms of population and households in those 35 municipalities, the total households are in order of 3.35 million. Population coverage in those 35 municipalities, 12.6 million. Uh, and the aggregate budgets of these municipalities, combined budgets at 29.8 billion. So, you know, if we do the assessment and follow through the process, uh, uh, you can see the, that, you know, 
Although, of course, the LGMM doesn't cover all the municipalities in any one year, it uh, does cover a significant uh, number of people. And if we start getting capabilities right in this municipality, the Im potential impact is on 29.6 million people. Next slide, please. So this is this sort of is is what we call a heat map, and it uh, basically gives an overview of how the municipalities, which are at the top, running from Amatoli across, and the standards, uh, uh, key performance areas, and the standards are on the left hand. Uh, what is that? I'm 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 informed that uh, there is no volume from your side. Other members can't hear you. Can you address that? The um, note that has come through to me. Oh, uh, sorry, my apologies. I thought I'm being heard. Can you hear me, Chair? I can hear you on my side, but I have a, a message from other members that they can't hear you. Oh, um, I don't know, I've got all my volume sorted and I'm also doing a quick test and it seems to be uh, on, on, on maximum, or close to maximum. It might be the settings on those particular members if some can hear me and others can't. Yeah, okay, continue. If, if, if the, the problem persists, they will let me know. You can continue. Okay, Th um, uh, thank you, Chair. All right, so th th this is, as I said, the heat map, and it, it's just a, a high level representation of what the results look like. Uh, and we can see that there are, um, um, you know, very few uh, uh, standards that uh, municipalities are performing well at, well, at least in this group. Uh, so, you know, the, there's the, the one on the IDP 1.1, you can see that uh, uh, there's less reds, basically. Uh, similarly with, um, uh, you know, the electrification, which is 2.6 on the left-hand side, less reds, more greens and so on. Uh, and um, uh, right at the bottom, delegations. Um, but you know, if we take if we take the whole group, if you look at the whole service delivery area, you can see it's awash with reds or ones. Similarly, with financial management uh, and um, of course the others. So you, we can see that in important areas, this particular group of municipalities uh, um, um, are not performing according to the LGMM assessment. Um, so, you know, uh, particularly in, 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 in key areas like water and sanitation and so on. All right, so we've lost the pre uh, uh, presentation, but I'm gonna continue on my side. The um, presentation continues with uh, uh, a different uh, picture of the, of the heat map, which, was, which just shows that if you take out all the, uh, the next slide, please. So, so in the next slide, um, if we go to the next slide. But I'm gonna continue. The next slide is just a, a different way of, of seeing the results, you know, in a sort of aggregate way. Uh, in collective way. Uh, but I want to now go into sort of the, the details of each of these KPAs and standards. Uh, if we can get to that. If not, I'm basically on slide 15. Um, and here, if we go to the first standard, we'll see that that deals with integrate, integrated development planning and implementation. So here, a, a, a large number all right, this was the slide, it's, it's another form of the heat map. So if we were to take out the ones and twos, you can see that uh, um, where the, the areas of performance actually reside. 
uh, and in which municipalities more clearly. So municipalities in, like in Kangala uh, uh, are doing very, very well similarly. Anyway, here's the detail. So if you look at the first standard, right, of the uh, municipalities that we have, you can see on the, the just the, the, the quality of the planning, uh, um, you know, a significant number, 13 of those uh, scored at level one and six. Uh, on 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 level two. So in other words, uh, either um, poorly, right, or unsatisfactory, and very few at a high level. The the next part of it is, of course, around you know that's the planning. But how do they translate that into serv a service delivery improvement plan, which is the SDPIP, and of course, uh, uh, to what extent that plan. Uh, is on an annual basis uh, uh, reasonably budgeted for. And there too, the numbers that are scoring at one and two uh, uh, are high, uh, you know, compared to others who are not. All right, so if we move, so that's just the situation in relation to the first KPA. If we get to the service delivery one, uh, we can see that in the provision of basic services, uh, it's a bit better with uh, uh, a lot more municipalities scoring at level 12, uh, but also then at level two. Um, and then, uh, but on water and sanitation, uh, we've got, uh, uh, you know, uh, a serious underperformance. And this is uh, uh, that many of those, uh, you can see it's compared to standard 2.3, which, show, which is the municipal strategic self-assessment. This is what water and sanitation does. And that is, a, it talks about the functionality of the uh, water service authorities. In other words, the operational capabilities in terms of um, about 18 uh, um, recognized um, operational functions and attributes of uh, water and, and sanitation function. And they score very poorly. So of course, uh, you know, if, if the institutions are not working, uh, they, uh, then uh, you know, water and sanitation services is going to be affected. Um, I'm sure by now everybody's seen the the. Um, so that's that seems to be the sort of performance across services, which is of course is a very worrying sign. If we go to the next uh, um, area, which is on human resource, and this is this is where uh, we we check whether municipalities are applying the prescribed recruitment practices. Um, uh, members of the committee would be are aware that um, um, that um, uh, you know we government has uh, published. Uh, competency requirements for senior managers. Uh, and, and, th and that is because, I mean, the Auditor General has constantly highlighted that uh, a key problem uh, prior to the, uh, uh, you know, the promulgation of those regulations, about 70% of se senior managers uh, um, were not a are not competent or skilled enough to do the jobs. On that basis, the government in introduced um, minimum competency and recruitment requirements, and this is what it shows. So again, not 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 twelve, 12 uh, at level one and two at level three, uh, which is nine and and another three at uh, higher. So again, the sort of compliance or uh, uh, with the with the uh, recruitment practices and the minimum competency uh, um, requirements are, are, are low. Uh, also performance management uh, of senior managers is, is, uh, is underperforming totally. We can look at 25 of them are e either at level well, two, 20 at level two and uh, uh, five at level one. Next slide, please. So this is on financial management, and I think this is a picture which um, many of us would expect given the sort of dire straits of finance, uh, uh, finances 
dire financial situations in many municipalities. And this just um, reflects that picture. But the issue here is that is, you know, um, there's a lot of things that's in the hands of municipalities. I mean, budget planning is is within your control and, ha and, and you know, you, if you have the right people, you should be able to come up with a credible budget, uh, you know, and, um, but as the results here show, so again, virtually all of them, right, don't have a credible budget. Uh, then um, uh, the irregular expenditure is also, I mean, uh, significant. Revenue challenges remained, which is standard 4.3. Uh, and of course, supply chain uh, problems. So um, all of those are, are key to, to um, a healthy financial situation in municipalities. And we can see with this particular group uh, of municipalities, the results are very, very poor. Uh, and I, I suppose, you know, in a sense, we can generalize this to um, you know, many municipalities across. If we go to the next um, one, next standard touched on community engagement. So this is the, the tries to see to what extent the, the municipalities take community engagement and participation seriously. Um, and there, um, again, we've, um, uh, we, we, we're not seeing good results. And this highlights the sort of analysis that's come through, coming through uh, various surveys where communities uh, uh, significant, I mean, just 40 to 46% of uh, communities uh, 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 feel that uh, municipalities uh, um, are sufficiently engaging them. If we go to the um, next one, which is on governance, there's a, um, eight standards un under governance which we, we track. Um, and this uh, this ties in with with uh, you know what um, is in, uh, what is raised by the auditor general about the quality of internal controls. So we we in the in that particular the next uh, yeah in this particular key performance area you'll see that we uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the key things. Um, related to internal controls and conduct. So the Municipal Public Accounts Committee's audit findings, internal audit functioning, and so on. And there, I mean, of course, the, the, the results, again, are not uh, particularly encouraging uh, in general. Uh, delegations are the ones which uh, has the largest green bar. Um, but that's often um, something that's easier to do. Um, but um, uh, be that as it may, that's where the, the best performance was recorded. So that's, that's then the picture. If we go to um, the, uh, just to um, the next slide, which is slide 21 is wh where we just, uh, update the um, committee on uh, where we are in relation to, of course, this year, which is, uh, which is also impacted upon by, as we know, COVID. Uh, but um, so we went through the similar process of uh, approaching the, the provinces uh, and, um, um, you know, uh, identifying municipalities and uh, even under these difficult conditions, we have received commitments. Commitments by commitment, I mean signed letters from MMs, and, and that's from 23 municipalities. So not bad, you know, under the circumstances. Uh, we've also managed to uh, orientate and train all of the, uh, so we changed our system to a um, virtual system. Uh, and, um, um, you know, so that, uh, of course, the process doesn't get held up and uh, it worked quite well with given the training. 
and that happened on the 30th of September. Um, so assessments will, will the, you know, that process will continue and we, we expect their assessments to be completed by November, after which we'll do moderation and, and you know, subsequent phases which will involve review and finalization. Uh, just to say, and then the last one is just an update on uh, improvement planning. Now this is where the, this is where the difficulties arise. The the slide there depicts the you know the improvement planning that we do. In other words, SDPME, where we uh, permitted to get directly involved. And as this slide shows, those are the municipalities that are active. Okay, um, and uh, so the, even the previous cohort we've got. Kamisberg, Namakwa, and all that are uh, producing regular quarterly monitoring reports and so on. But the the hello, municipalities hello. which province provinces. Hello, Hassan, yes. can you hear me? Hassan. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, can can you? Yes, I can hear you. Can, can you move towards uh, wrapping up because we have other two presentation to receive. Of course, I will. Let me just quickly go to the conclusion. So I am on the last slide now. Uh, so the important point in the conclusion, which uh, uh, you know that I want to stress, um, um, is is of course that you know we we're still finding that uh, provincial departments are not playing their part despite the commitments. The, in order to sort of overcome some of this stuff, we the future is, is sort of how we're looking at this is that in the context that the DDM firstly presents us with an, with an opportunity. Remember part of the DDM is not only to, of course, uh, ensure that uh, we, we, we uh, effect development, but the DDM is also intended to, as it goes about working in districts and all that to build capacity of municipalities. And, we, when, and so we wanna uh, encourage this to be, uh, and, and ensure that this LGMIM is a key component of, uh, of that process so that it is able to give uh, uh, insights into the workings of municipalities, their capabilities and what uh, uh, support and uh, improvements are needed there in terms of building capacity. Um, we of, of course will be engaging with uh, National DCOG in this regard. Um, you know, so uh, so that's that's uh, in some, uh, the the sort of uh, let me let me leave it there. I think I've already sort of gone past, but we'll we'll can follow up with discussions. Thank you uh, for your patience and time, Chair. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. That concludes our presentation on this uh, topic. Without much ado, and with your permission, Chair, I'll ask that we take the next uh, presentation. In fact, the two presentations, because they will be done by one person, I'll just ask her to deal with both the presentations and focus on salient issues. We now have less than two hours to finish the meeting. So, okay. Dr. Bihar? Okay, so right. Good, good morning, honorable members, uh, DG, DDGs, and colleagues. Uh, I'm presenting the presidential hotline the presentation as, um, as the head of uh, frontline service delivery monitoring and the presidential uh, hotline uh, is part, is one of the tools of, that we use in DPME uh, in providing evidence as well as responding to uh, citizens' complaints as well. The next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, I won't dwell on the content because, uh, you know, I know everybody has read it, uh, read it. Well, the purpose of the presentation is basically to respond to the question that was posed by the committee, as well as, uh, you know, to give the scope of the report. It will extend right from the very start of the lockdown which was on the 27th of March to, 20, uh, to the 30th of September, 2020. 
the, uh, the next slide, please. But we are mindful of the fact that we have presented the portfolio committee with uh, reports uh, that were asked by the uh, portfolio committee. We actually presented two reports uh, to the portfolio committee already. Now, just in case we have new members, I think I need to stress that the presidential hotline is actually an apex complaint management tool. So that means that uh, practically it means that people come to us when they've exhausted all other means of, of, uh, of interacting with the, the, the department's concerns. And, uh, you know, the presidential hotline, uh, we receive uh, complaints from the toll-free number, call center, emails, letters, and walk-ins. And uh, we could move to the other side, uh, to the other slide, and it's captured on an electronic monitoring system. Uh, and we also monitor the resolutions of of uh, of the of the complaints. Now, this is actually a very important slide from the, uh, in terms of our our how we interact with our the whole of government, as well as how we relate it to the National Development Plan and how we monitor and how we, uh, as DPME, also present the findings in an integrated monitoring report that we present to cabinet as well. Now, basically, the presidential hotline is linked to offices of the premier, and they consist of provincial, what we refer to as provincial uh, liaison, our, they lead us in, from a, a provincial perspective in terms of our provincial uh, public liaison, uh, uh, public liaison uh, forum as well that we lead as uh, the presidency. Uh, now, what is important in terms of COVID is that due to lockdowns, that uh, the presidential, our, our formal relationships and our informal relationships with our partners across government, the other levels of government. I'll give you one, one example of where we actually uh, use them under lockdown conditions when we were actually not allowed to go uh, across provinces. For example, as I've mentioned, the presidential hotline receives walk-ins as well. And the Hitikani, uh, uh, the Hitikani Women's Group came to uh, the union building to report to us that they, uh, you know, they were given a land. They are a cooperative, a women's group who is a cooperative in the, in the Giani area. And they, they, and uh, they were given permission because for a, co a cooperative and were given land in terms of the permission to occupy in, uh, in, uh, by the traditional council. And they wanted us as the presidential hotline to actually intervene in this process. And what, what we had found was that, uh, you know, we had to get, uh, get around the table with a whole lot of, of stakeholders and also mediate with the traditional council to actually ensure that the, uh, that these women were actually, uh, um, actually get some, get that permission to occupy. Now it wasn't actually, the mediation wasn't actually that easy in that another commit, another, uh, another organization was given the exact spot of land where these women were actually uh, given, and they had already got uh, livelihood activities going. So in, uh, in terms of when the lockdown happened, we had just about concluded the PTO because we didn't want to release, uh, you know, tell it was a resolution uh, on a hotline ferry until we actually were in possession of the PTO for the uh, for these women, and because of lockdown conditions, we couldn't actually go. And what we had done was 
our, in terms of using the offices of the premier and the municipal contacts, uh, the informal relationships that we have, they were actually given the PTO and because, and, and that we stressed that even if it's locked down, they had to get it because it was their livelihood. And because it was agriculture, it also, uh, you know, ensured food security for a small little community that were there. Also another, another example of how we actually responded is actually uh, we had, uh, because as I say, as Frontline, we built very good uh, networks, including with communities. And they do get our, our cell phone numbers and our email addresses and another community member through email directly to my email address had contacted us about water tankers not available once again in the Iqiani, uh local municipality. And through our, in our, our relationships with the municipalities, with the offices of the premier, we managed to actually get those tankers out to this community who doesn't have access to, uh, you know, normal flows of water. So, so therefore, these in these informal relationships, I think, in building a capable state, is also extremely important if we are going to, uh, you know, uh, lead us on community uh, to meet the community development principles of what we are trying to achieve. The next slide, please. I'll I'll actually go. Uh, the next slide, please. Well, the next slide is basically how we work, and I will quickly, in case the committee is not aware, some of the members, I will actually just state very quickly, is that the hotline uh, call center is actually our outsourced to CETA and uh, you know from and it cuts across uh, you know we get calls we get uh, all emails and uh, we also get it through post walk-ins and whatever we get is actually uh, you know in terms of this slide that's there we actually put it in terms of our our electronic uh, system and it's captured there whether it's a walk-in whether it's a, a thing and people get acknowledgement immediately that within three days is our norms and stand is our standard where you get uh, acknowledgement that your query has been logged on and our standard for response for the resolution is actually um, 25 days and then the presidential hotline staff they are the, the the team the case management team who actually monitors the the resolution rate in terms of our standards and then they intervene uh with the offices of the premier and the local municipalities where uh, there's gaps to actually respond to this so there's a team at, based at union buildings who actually monitor this. The next slide, please. The next slide, please. Well, basically the next slide is about our capacity. We've got, well, as I say, we based, uh, we have a, a SLA with CETA and then our union building staff is 18 members of staff and uh, our PLO forum is actually uh, national. And then we've got PLOs across uh, the national departments as well. Now, I think it's also important for us to, to talk about some of the improvements we're making. Yesterday, actually, because through working, national departments are actually also uh, building up their local, their uh, PLO forums going down, uh, you know, in terms of the provincial, their partnerships with their uh, provincial counterparts. And yesterday, I was in a meeting uh, and with me and my team, we were in the meeting with the Department of Human, um, of Human Settlements, and they have actually signed, an, uh, you know, they've, they've actually strengthened their, uh, their PLO forum with their provincial counterparts 
through uh, SLA as well as building up proper terms of reference for how they operate here. So, so this is where we as the presidential hotline are also finding other avenues of how we could strengthen resolution as well, besides the offices of the premier, but how we strengthen national departments also with their, you know, with their roles in a provincial level as well. And the focus is on how they respond to communities. The next slide, please. As I've mentioned in the next slide, the, the first COVID report was on the 28th of March because we actually were an essential, we were classified an essential service by the president and the call center was, call centers were also in terms of the regulations also classified as uh, essential services. Then we, we actually uh, had to uh, quickly adapt our queries uh, to uh, ensure that we were monitoring COVID uh, uh, responses, but we also had to ensure that uh, our, our, we had good links with the COVID helplines as well. Uh, there was, uh, the next slide please, we can see that there were the next, well the next slide is actually the spatial Uh, it shows us the spatial spread of the next slide, please. The next slide actually shows us the spatial, uh, the spatial, uh, uh, where we, the spatial aspects of where we were getting our our complaints from, and we can see it now. This this is directly related to the DDM in that, you know, we it shows a differentiated approach to space that, uh, and also shows us some policy that we cannot neglect uh, urban areas at the expense of uh, rural areas because most of our complaints and COVID hotspots were actually in terms of our, our big cities such as Cape Town, such as uh, Johannesburg, Swane, uh, Itikwini, Ilembe, you know, the bigger municipalities. So it does show some relationship with the DDM. The next slide actually shows that our calls were actually in direct relation. It escalated with the president's uh, uh, announcements of the next slide, please. It was announced with the president's, uh, that we could even move to the next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, you know, the, 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 the types of complaints we were getting was on food parcels, and that actually also correlates with the NIDS and the CRAM study that was undertaken that the main concern of our citizens were based on, citizen, uh, on uh, COVID, uh, during COVID, and thereafter, well, at the first stage, people were wondering about permits, that was because of the funeral, uh, of the funerals, uh, you know, the, uh, people wanted access to funerals. And we actually did uh, send this because my colleagues from uh, our other branches were sitting at the NAT joint and we did send uh, our reports about the permits and subsequently the regulations were changed on that. The next slide, please. We, we can also see that our complaints were also related, the number of complaints contained and led in the number of the most number of complaints, given the demographics of the province, also uh, Limpopo and, and KZN, given the, the demographics of the province and the big and the COVID, they were COVID hotspots, but also to say that this is not unusual for our, for our findings that counting also always actually uh, leads us in terms of the types of complaints uh, with the numbers of complaints given the demographics of the area. We can move to the next slide, please. Now we're moving into our first quarter report. Uh, well, that was our first quarter report. It shows us once again that food parcels was 
particularly important across all, uh, all provinces, as well as unemployment relief to a certain extent. But the others were because it was basically, once again, in terms of meeting immediate needs of communities, because that was the main concern during COVID. And the immediate needs were based on water. The other uh, took into account the other and other, uh, you know, water, electricity ac access to basic services. The next slide, please. Uh, once again, we can see the national view in the second quarter. It followed the same ki a kind of uh, provincial overview of the different provinces. The next slide, please. The next slide please, uh, shows the second quarter once again, but we could see now that with the lockdown, we moved and with the stabilization of our other, our in our other departments, and particularly with social development, we actually moved to, to our, our food parcels actually were uh, relieved. But what's interesting is although COVID was a health pandemic, uh, our health department was actually on top of it, and health wasn't actually top of, uh, of the queries of the departments, as well as uh, it was actually based on our social relief uh, impacts. Now, I also want to stress that I was actually, as the head of the presidential hotline, I was actually deployed into the communications um, net joint, in that we knew during lockdown that some of these issues had to be addressed from a communications and, uh, and we fed our responses, these, these issues into our, our higher level structures and into our communication plans of, the, of, the, of, of government. The next slide, once again, uh, you know, it's, uh, the next slide, please. We could move because I've already discussed the key trends. Uh, the next slide, now this is an important slide. What we found in the first quarter was our resolution rate was 99% because we, we actually were referring the cases to the, the COVID responses. Uh, to the other COVID lines because of the information that we needed to give. But uh, in terms of our second quarter, our, our resolution rate had dropped to say a 46, and that was actually a result, as we can see, that these were in terms of our standards. It was basically Gauteng province that actually was 30%. Now, we share a very good relationship as the presidential hotline with all the provinces in terms of improvements and how we actually go forward. And when we actually spoke to Gauteng province, what we had found, we had found earlier actually in the lockdown, not at the end of the second quarter, because as I said, we used, uh, we were, because of the other calls we were getting, we had to keep interacting with our offices of premiers to actually ensure when we got trends to immediately respond. So we did pick it up earlier that the, uh, uh, the, the presidential hotline staff of Kauteng province was actually moved at an early stage by the premier of this province with other community outreach programs, in, in particular the food banks, because food became a major problem. And, and Gauteng province was quite, they had taken over, they led in terms of the, the food parcels in that province, whilst uh, DSD and uh, FASA were, were actually getting ready for their rollout. So, so that was one of the, uh, of the things that we actually found as, as the presidential hotline from a monitoring point of view. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, the next slide is basically telling us that, telling us, uh, you know, talking about some of the improvements we're making. We're actually improving, like I, last year, I did report to this committee 
about our improvements with uh, with the support of DSR, with the support of the Department of Science and Innovation and CSIR. Our report, uh, they did a diagnostic of the presidential hotline. The report was finalized on the 31st of March. And because of lockdown, uh, you know, uh, CSIR was actually overloaded and they couldn't actually uh, present the reports and take the findings. So we couldn't take the findings, the recommendations, but we will be doing it. They did go over and above what they, what our country, our SLA was with them, and they did develop a prototype of data, a data analytics platform, and that was, uh, you know, we tried because, as I showed earlier, the importance of the hotline in, uh, you know, in the spatial as well, and uh, in terms of our links to the DDM as the presidency. So we have asked them to give us input in that particular one. So in in uh, in terms of this this and the other the other parts were some of our our improvements in line with our operations that we actually have liaised with Peter as well. So with that, this is the presidential hotline uh, presentation. Thank you, GC. Thanks. Uh, Chair, with your permission, again, I will ask her to continue with the next uh, presentation. Okay, continue. I actually forgot that our app, our app, we also developed an app, as our our deputy minister actually said uh, that our app was actually developed because once again, uh, you know, to extend coverage to our citizens, particularly in rural areas. But we are we are being cautious in the rollout, and we are piloting it so to make sure that we are hundred percent perfect by the time we actually go national. So so this is uh, you know I've actually uh, omitted to actually say that, and uh, so so that was actually it uh, it, and some of the challenges during uh, the COVID was actually addressed. Uh, you know, the unavailability of our PLOs, our DG did assist us in trying to, and the, without tools, we, we did send letters to all offices of the premiers and and uh, the departments to actually uh, make sure that presidential hotline staff, uh, the PLOs were actually uh, prioritized for tools of trade. Uh, we did receive a number of prank calls and that we could account for maybe people were bored with uh, the lockdown and uh, you know also uh, well well we've dealt with the other issues so with that DG uh, my apologies for missing that out but with that uh, thank you very much thank you uh, can I note hands now for for discussion on this on this presentation, and uh, I want to correct. Uh, what I registered uh, Honorable Maluleke as uh, as an apology. She has joined the meeting. She is part of of the meeting. So, Maskole, you, you can correct that. Thank you very much. Let me see hands of those who want to speak. Chair, Honorable Chair, Chairperson. Hello. Yes, Chair. Yes, I can hear you. It's Kili here. Yeah, but the best is to raise hands in the platform. Yes, my hand is raised, Chair. Yeah, I call. It's not in there. Okay. Yeah, you can, I, you can take, the, can take the platform, Honorable Gilly. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, uh, Honorable Members and the family of TPME. Jefferson, let me appreciate the presentation by the team and uh, also welcome it. Uh, Honorable Chair, on LG Imam, uh, 
one understands really that it is attempt, those are the attempts to assist in building a, a local government as uh, they are really uh, saying. Now, I want to, to ask a, a, this question. Uh, there are champions and coordinators uh, in provinces and municipalities that have been appointed uh, from uh, well-doing municipalities and provinces. So are the champions, are those champions uh, appointed from the well-doing municipalities and, and provinces? And if uh, it, it's not like that, what is the criteria for the uh, appoint uh, for appointing uh, those uh, uh, champions? My second one, uh, Honorable Chair, is that uh, uh, there is a turnover of municipal managers, uh, chief financial officers, and other senior managers in municipalities. Uh, does it have an impact on the lack of improvement in most municipalities? Uh, and then what can be done in this regard? On uh, DGM, I want to know, Honorable Chair, what is the view of uh, public representatives on the district development model initiative across the three spheres of government? Is the model acceptable as a noble idea? And my second one for DGM, what kind of infrastructure project, projects or any projects uh, do the three spheres of government uh, partnered on with the aim of improving quality of lives of the citizens? Uh, those are my questions. And I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kibi. Uh, can, can, can members please open their video as they, uh, they speak? Uh, I have noted the following. Honorable Sorry. Som. Sorry. Honorable Chair. Uh, it's Honorable Som. Yes. Honorable, Honorable Clark. Yes. Honorable Komani. Honorable BC in that order. And Honorable Musibe, Chairperson. Did you raise your hands in the platform? I, no, you I, haven't. Okay, I will note you, I will note you as well, Honorable Musibe. Thank you, Chairperson. Can you Chair, check my hand, Chairperson, if it's um, reflecting? Okay. Can you check? Because I did uh, yeah. raise my hand. Now you Chairperson. have raised it, uh, Honorable. Uh, Duly. Okay. Chairperson Malachi is also here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the platform, Honorable Soma. No check. May I pass for now? Thank you. The next will be Honorable Clark. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, firstly, you know, when, I, when, when we discuss this presentation in terms of the status quo of local government, um, it's really, really worrying. And um, I would like to know how they're going to go about in order to ensure that local government actually comply to their service delivery charters because they actually don't do that. You know, they don't comply to the um, hour ratio that they have to attend to complaints and, and, and certainly doesn't happen. That's the first thing. Um, local government certainly um, faces financial and inst institutional collapse. And we have an unbelievable shortage of critical skills within the system. Um, you know, many people, many um, professionals like engineers and et cetera, no longer apply for jobs in local government because local government's um, environment is so toxic and politicized. And how are we going to be dealing with rectifying <clears throat> that? And um, I'll just give you an example. I mean, for instance, you know, the energy department within Ekureleni, they have 
951 employees in the energy department where the nursery requirements is 1,700 employees. So they don't comply at all to even the nurses specifications. And therefore we have an absolute huge problem around energy supply. And I think that, you know, that, that, that issue is duplicated in many instances within local government. Um, how are they going to deal with um, corruption within local government, which, you know, shatters the, uh, the supply chain management um, um, a structure that's in place that they should adhere to? Um, then also, um, what would the district model actually entail? And will we receive the um, reports in terms of the pilot projects to see um, what has been realized within those pilot projects. And um, just, just to sort of also, um, uh, uh, you know, highlight that the district model proposes to establish permanent uh, command control councils um, with executive powers. And that certainly isn't within the constitution. So I'm not sure how that is being dealt with because surely we have to stick to what the constitution um, provides for us. Thank you, Chairperson. Your Honourable Clerk, can uh, Honourable Komani come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair, uh, and good morning. And uh, let me apologize for not switching the video on because due to the, uh, my network problem. I've got one question that I would want to ask the Department of Cooperative Governance in terms of their KPA 5 that speaks to the watch committees. Uh, my question would then be, how, what is the yardstick that they would use, they use to measure the competency of the, of, of, of the watch committees uh, in line with the service delivery that is to be happening? Equally, what, how, how, how do they then measure that against the, the, the priorities in terms of the watch-based priorities? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Honorable Komani. Can I have now Honorable CBC? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I don't know whether you can hear me. My network is bad, and I wish to apologize about the picture. Uh, uh, I would like to have a few questions to Kokta. We have all, my first question is, we have all these objectives laid out on slide six. But what we are not being told is how these objectives will be achieved. Now, is there a clear strategic plan that details how each one of these objectives will be met? My other question would be, is there any infrastructural funding talks that may have been instituted to ensure that this model is realized? The realization of this model will create jobs, both direct and indirect. The last question is, with regards to the issues covered during the visit, particularly on service delivery issues, are there any plans or measures that will soon be set in motion to circumvent the lack of, of service delivery? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Smith. Can I have Honorable Ndoli? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, uh, Honorable Gibi has covered most of the uh, issues that have uh, touched, um, hinted on here. But uh, nevertheless, Chair, I wanted to check something in terms of a uh, presidential hotline. Um, when when responding, uh. In most cases, people report things that are affecting communities. Now, in responding, does the response end with the individuals or have they created a platform to address communities in this regard? And two, in terms of uh, DDM, 
it's it's one would like uh, oh, to 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 comment uh, the concept and uh, also DPME to be part and parcel of uh, monitoring uh, on, on this one as well. To say now um, the initial plan, the initial plan, is it a uh, complementing processes in 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 district and advance or it's just a complete new uh, uh, um or they reflect on complete new projects for instance you'll find that there is a road that was started in that district but due to funding it was not um finished now what will happen to 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 this model can this model look at that road first or they are going to start another road a new road if that that is example uh, particularly what is uh, happening on the ground maybe the 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 the, the, the what you call the bridge uh, is not finished but you'll find now the in, in, within the concept of the district model, uh, prioritizing something else other than complete. I'm just checking their 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 approach in that regard. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Malazi. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm going to limit my questions to the presidential hotline. I mean, one of the worries that I had looking at the presentation was with concern to the resolution rate of cases or logged calls um, by the Houting, um, by the Houting Premier's Office or the Houting Provincial Government. And I mean, I do get the, the, the justification that was put in earlier that there was a shift of, you know, their public license officers or the people in charge of that aspect to focus more on COVID related related issues rather than resolving the issues that came through from, from that call. But I'm also, you know, trying to reconcile that with the fact that there was a COVID related help desk that dealt in particular with COVID related queries. So I'm just trying to, to reconcile that. And secondly, Chair is, you know, for us to have a measure of the efficiency in terms of the resolution rate of, of, of the presidential hotline, I think it's it, it would have been useful to have, you know, the stats pre-COVID vis-a-vis the stats of the resolution of cases during the COVID phase, because rather than do the quarterly one, because the quarterly two are the the quality one is quite skewed because even though it's two successive periods, it doesn't give you a far more um, detailed and far more insightful uh, measure of the number of cases that have been resolved, for instance, over the last year um, compared to, 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 to this period. And secondly, I mean, my last, my last question is related to the Kauleza app. I, I take the point that it is in pilot phase, and I would just like to establish what is the duration of that pilot phase, because the presentation is silent about that. So that once again, you know, we, we are able to, to then measure the longevity of what is considered the pilot phase, so that when that time comes, we'll be able to accurately um, measure the difference that you know the app has made in terms of you know accelerating resolutions and you know bringing um, communication far much closer to people's fingertips um, so that cases are resolved quickly. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Soma. Honorable Soma, I know you have a network problem where you are. I'm giving you uh, the opportunity now. 
Uh, and how much bet? I think. Oh, I can step down. Okay. I can wait for you, Honorable Man. Okay. All right. Can I come in, Chairperson? Yeah, come in, Honorable Room Sleeper. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And then I would like to, to pose three questions. The first one is with regards to municipalities. Budget planning is poor in 27 municipalities and financial management is poor in 30 municipalities. What is the department's intervention in this regard? And then the other one is, does the, do these municipalities have internal audits and the municipal managers to monitor good governance? Where performance bonuses paid in these municipalities? And then the last one is, uh, the presidential hotline for citizen complaint. How sure are you that this will benefit the citizens without any fear or favor or discrimination, discriminating others? And this will be no backlogs or of responses. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable uh, Honorable Soma Kamil. Chairperson, good morning, colleagues, and thank you, Honorable Chair. And also, let me let let, let us welcome the status report as presented, all of them. Having said that, Chair, probably moving forward, uh, at the end of the presentation, we must receive something that talks to recommendations to the portfolio committee. Uh, I, 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 because some of the questions would have been covered if there was there were recommendations, because we are also policymakers and also we oversight in terms of uh, policy implementation and good governance. That would be my first point because I was going all presentation to say, what do you, where do you think the portfolio committee can play a role and assist in which space? would be that, but I'm, I'm raising that so that next time we don't just receive a report and then we just ask and then just note there's nothing because I know Auditor General also does audit the performance of the committees as well. Having said that, I think in a, in a way, uh, what Honorable Mal Malazi was raising that uh, in terms of, he, he used the word efficiency rate, I would say probably also if we can receive, uh, in terms of the hotline, uh, practical evidence-based examples. I know that uh, a, a, a Limpompo example was made, but also the other ones. And also, what program do you have as DPME family in terms of all these pro programs that are driven under your office to make sure that the public and other institutions, they know that there's a value add on these things and also so that they can also assist to identify the gaps and make suggestions where possible. Because I, I, I rest assured from where I'm coming from, uh, we, we, we don't know, we do, we do not hear much about the whole presidential hotline and the value add. Having said that about the presidential hotline chair is that probably it's more linked to Honorable Montipia's question as well to say if we can get the appetite and the positive response of the municipalities or matters that we would have raised and their completion in its logical conclusion. Is the other thing to refer the matter and then go back to the complaint and to say that your matter is referred there, but the actual positive conclusion of that, of that complaint, uh, it, 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 you can't measure it. Uh, you continuously get dissatisfied uh, communities. The second one, Chair, to DPME, uh, which is linked with the LGMIM model as well. As we are going towards the local government elections, it has started already. There's a ad hoc like a spontaneous uh, service delivery protest and it happens in the previous years uh, towards the elections. Is there any deliberate uh, strategy to mitigate or to minimize those uh, pu public service protests? Because they tend to also to damage government uh, 
community property. I'm raising that because the, the, the first presentation did appreciate also that it's a dual a core project, so to say, in terms of COCTA and DPME. To say one would also love to get a, a plan to respond to that. And also how do you then, if municipalities and other spheres of government, which is, is, a, is a provincial government, you are not listening to, is it linked then, Chair, with the performance of uh, various ministers, which Honorable Timbu spoke about it on Thursday last week. Uh, I'm just showing it, I'm being opportunistic, but my understanding is that it has to be linked with all the programs that are within the DPSA as it were. The last one that I hope so, let me just go through my notes, Chair, my apology on this one. The, the last one will be a suggestion, Chair, because the, what we're discussing here in terms of the president is it, 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 it overlaps to COCTA and also to human settlement and water and sanitation. I would suggest that uh, 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 the DG, I'll say the DG because it's the accounting officer, to say that can you also make sure that you get a report from the recent report of oversight of COCTA portfolio committee, because it does talk to lots of things that honorable members have raised, which I would, definitely would have raised to say, in your role and your mandate of monitoring and evaluation, what would be your solution in those issues that that report will contain? That's all, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And my apology, the network has been taking me in and out from the system. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we get a response now from the department? Uh, Thanks, uh, Chairperson. I will uh, take a couple of uh, issues and then I'll refer others to colleagues. Just to start with what Honorable Kibi has uh, said, the, the first issue around the champions that have been sent to the different uh, districts. Our understanding is that at the national level, the champions have been delegated by the president. And at the provincial level, that has been done by the premiers in, 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 the, in the respective uh, provinces. So the understanding is that the, the delegation has a political authority, has the necessary uh, political authority so that uh, people can do the work that they are supposed to, to do. For example, uh, at the national level, this is one of the performance areas of ministers and, and DMs. So we Suppose that the same will obtain at the provincial level where the premiers will make sure that the, the delegation is linked to the performance of the delegated people. So there is a significant political authority to ensure that those who have been delegated do exactly what they have been delegated to do. Now, with respect to the impact of uh, turnover, it is a, a foregone conclusion that when we have that a high turnover of CFOs, chief technology officers, and MMs in municipalities, then we have a very big a challenge. Now, we have made this observation in a number of reports that we have prepared as a DPME, including in what we call the program of HM to the principals. And one of the things that we have been grappling with is the political admin interface how best to deal with that. We are working on the same issue at the national level. So Chair, I would suggest that at a later stage, perhaps ourselves, the PSA and, and DCOG come. We, we have lost you now. You are muted. Excuse me? At, at the national level to deal with this. But the point being made is that we have observed and we have alerted all the stakeholders that are involved as DPME that until we deal with this issue, it is at the heart of the capacity of the state. So the sooner we address this problem, the, the, the better. Now we expect the different stakeholders, including Salga, DCOG, to do something about this situation. Unfortunately, we only monitor and make a recommendation on, on that. Now, on the acceptability of the district development model in the different areas, 
the understanding is that uh, the president is sending ministers and DMs to participate in the DDM in the different areas. Two, the premiers are also doing the same and designating uh, MSCs to different areas. And the district mayors also have a responsibility to ensure that they liaise on the ground with the local uh, mayors and engage with them and explain to them what it is that we will be going to do. Now, what has happened at the national level, if I can give an example of Eriguana, which we were a part of, we then ensured that the minister, in this case, Minister Mtimbu and MEC Tlumuka in KZN, went to Eriguana, the Eriguana district. Then that allows the national ministers and the MECs to interface with everyone, the, including the district mayor and the local mayors. Now, once you do that, and, and, and you have one meeting where all political principles are, are, are present, then it helps to resolve a misunderstanding in terms of the purpose of the DDM and how it's going to be implemented in the, in the different areas. So we believe that that model that allows the national champions, the provincial champions, and the district mayors to meet with local mayors allow for that kind of an inter interface. It could be that, Chair, there are areas where such meetings have not uh, taken place. But I wish to believe that in areas where such meetings have happened, then we've been able to clarify all everything that needs to, to be clarified so that everyone can be on board. And I think as we move uh, forward, we can uh, revert to uh, that issue, uh, our own observation in terms of the buy-in, particularly by the local uh, municipalities. Because we know that for most of the time, Power has always been, most of the functions have always been with the local municipalities. And now when you move some of the functions or construe to be moving some of the functions to district municipalities, you are likely to have a, a, some a tensions because that a, amounts to some change in terms of the power configuration in the different areas. But we'll then a follow a, up on, on this issue. Now with regard to the infrastructure projects that are being implemented to improve the quality of, of service. Now that will vary from one e area to, an, to another. What has happened up to now is that COCTA has done a diagnosis of each and every municipality. So there is a chart that will show you the characteristics of a particular e municipality. So that when we make or, or come up with this a, one e plans for districts, then they are based on the specific requirements and needs of a particular district. So that is being uh, attended to. So we envisage speaking for na national uh, government that government departments, when they develop their annual performance plans for the next uh, financial year, they will also tap on what COFTA has, has done so that when they come with projects for different areas, those projects are guided by what is happening in that uh, particular uh, area. And that will also deal with the question that uh, one honorable member uh, raised about the ongoing projects, whether the introduction of the DDM will result in a situation whereby we skip what we have been doing and start with new projects. Now, based on the availability of that data on what is happening in the different areas, we should be in a position to ensure that the projects that have been pending are accelerated, are finalized, and, and, and finished for the sake of the community. Now, with what a honorable a drug said, now it, it is clear that the Municipal Finance Management Act is similar to the PFM. So everyone by now in, 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 in all spheres of government need to know what the prescripts are. One of the things that we are looking at is, is consequence management, you know, the state of consequence management. First, a, one of a disciplinary nature, but two, of lack of performance. So as we come back with the LG MIM uh, reports, one of the things that we want to uh, start focusing on is dealing with the uh, consequences for compliance because the rules of the game are already known. And this also dovetails with the issue of corruption at local government or throughout the uh, government that we need to do something about it. Now, there was mention uh, when uh, the president spoke the other time of the national anti-corruption strategy, which is quite very detailed in terms of what will be done to deal with uh, corruption. 
But the moral of the answer is that there is a need for us to speed up on consequence management, not only for compliance, but also for, for, for performance. Now, we, I mentioned the, 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 the work that we need to do on the political administration interface, uh, not only at local government, but also at national government. And I think together with DPSA, we can come back to present on what we're doing at, at national level to deal with uh, this uh, important uh, issue. I dealt with the corruption uh, issue. Then uh, Honorable Clark also asked what will DBM entail? Will there be reports on the, on the pilots? Yes, indeed, because up to now, our monitoring has been more on the establishment of the district uh, development uh, models in the different areas, as well as the impact of, of COVID. But key going forward is the work that we need to do now to drill in and come back to yourselves and say, in the OR Tambo municipality, since the institutionalization and the launch of the DBM, this is what is happening in that area. Now, this will entail two types of reporting. One is to report based on outputs to say this is what is happening. But then what we're trying to do at, D, at, at, at DPME is to start focusing on impact. And we will pilot the impact assessment in, in, in the next few weeks, where we are trying to get as many intents as it is possible to work with, department, with the department to go and assess the impact of government's interventions on COVID. Because the reports that we've been giving you on COVID have focused on the outputs that we did this. But we have not told you whether it has made a difference in the lives of the people. So that is what we are going to do. But this obviously comes with the limited resources that we have. So we will have to be creative and see how others that we work with can assist us. So I have asked the department with some to use the money that we have saved because of the delay in some of the posts that we are filling to get interns who are professionals to help us to go down there and assess the actual impact of the interventions of government. So that will be a start of us going down to look at the actual delivery beyond just talking about the structures and, instit and institutions. Now, with regard to the constitutionality of the governance model of the DDM, I think it is foregone that we don't have an option as a government not to follow what the constitution say. Now, the, the, what we refer to as decision-making capabilities of those institutions is informed by, by the fact that all of them have respective powers that are recognized. But there's also a need for a cooperative e -govern governance and government. And we don't think that the implementation of cooperative governance necessarily is, is necessarily outside the bounds of the uh, constitution. So we will follow the constitution, respect each other's uh, powers as they are set in the, in, the, in, the in the constitution. Now, just to round up on, 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 on my side, um, I had mentioned uh, the district diagnosis that have been done. And now, uh, Honorable Malachi on the, uh, Malachi on the, on the pilot, I think what, what is clear with the pilot is that when it comes to technology systems, it's work in progress. You will never see, reach a stage where you will say that we are done with improving a technology uh, uh, innovation that we are introducing. So as, as much as we call it a pilot, the system is already working and we will continue to evaluate it on a regular basis uh, such that it becomes uh, optimal when, when, when it deals with the kind of issues that we are trying to, to grapple with. So much as we refer to it as a pilot, it is in the nature of uh, technology systems that uh, we'll talk uh, like that. But what is important is that as we speak now, there is evidence of the use of the system by South Africans. And we will continue to do the review on that. And but colleagues can speak on the specific uh, time frames of the uh, of the pilot. But my emphasis is that the nature of the pilot in this case is such that you pilot as you do work, so that we can then um, improve on the in, in innovation. Now, lastly, on uh, Honorable Mozipe, on budgeting and, and planning in poor municipalities, I think we we, we have dealt with it. 
Now, the big question is, and this question must be confronted, whether going forward, some of the municipalities will survive the crunch, whether they can survive on their own as standalone municipalities, or there is a need for some kind of, of, of innovation, which may even re result in some reconfiguration of in municipalities. Now, that, in our view, is something that should be on the horizon. And I must admit that we have not gone into that as a DPME, but it's a matter that we can take up a, with Cogta as a, Honorable Lisoma is guided that we also look at the recent engagements between the department and the portfolio committee and take into consideration the recommendations of the portfolio committee that it deals with in that particular area. Yes, Honorable Monsepe, we have audit, internal audit committees we have internal audit functions and external audit support in, in all municipalities because that is required by the municipal, the, the MFMA. So it is foregone that each and every municipality needs to have these instruments. And I understand the question is loaded in that, why do we fail when we have internal audits in, 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 in the different areas, in the different municipalities? And that is a matter that is not only applying to municipalities, but also we're grappling with the same issue because we do have a bad audits, even at national government level. Why is it that even in the presence of local or, or internal audits, we still have a bad audits in, in, in local government? And I'll ask Hassan to perhaps a time allowing to speak on, on, on this issue. Now, Honorable Ms. Lisoma, your issues around the recommendations, just very quickly on my side. Uh, we take the point that you are making that every presentation to the portfolio committee should end with the recommendations, either for what the committee needs to do in collaboration with other committees, whether in the, at the provincial level or even at the national level. For example, the case of counting may entail yourself having to engage with other portfolio committees in, in counting, I'm referring to the presidential e hotline. So I take responsibility for that. And then we apologize that there were no pointed in recommendations in some of the of the of the presentations that we, we, we made. So we done that. We'll do that e going forward. The marketing of the presidential hotline is a very important e pillar of the work that we do. Unfortunately, due to limited resources, we can only do so much to market the a presidential outline. But what I think we need to do uh, going forward is to use all platforms, not always about creating new platforms, but to make sure that using all the platforms, whether in Bezos, wherever we go and interact with stakeholders, whatever documents we send out, then always remind South Africans that you have the presidential outline to use to seek recourse for the lack of service delivery. Now on the service delivery in process, what the Honorable uh, Lisoma is referring to in my view is that, do we have any warning systems that can tell us what is happening out there? Our impression, uh, Honorable Members, is that the local sphere of government, most of the time do know what is coming up. But what we have not uh, done, uh, and then maybe colleagues from COCTA can speak to this, we have not done monitoring per se of protests as DPME. What we'll normally do, we will only go and, and investigate when there are problems so that we can involve the, inform the principals. So I think colleagues from COCTA can be, speak at length on this important issue. But what we can say from a DPME point of view is that when we hear that there are uh, challenges in certain areas, we send people to go and investigate independently and then he send reports to the principals so that they can know what is, is happening. The performance of the ministers is one of the landmark uh, development, a uh, significant achievement of this uh, administration, which is good, is good as done. And we are in the process now of wanting to publish the, the performance agreements that have been signed by the ministers on the website of, of government, the www.gov.za. So there is work that we are doing with the GCIS to prepare for the publication of the performance agreements, which in our view will go a long way in also ensuring that at the provincial and local government, 
something is done to 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 deal with uh, uh, such uh, issues. So, Chair, I've attempted to deal with uh, some of the issues. I think there may be one or two areas of uh, emphasis which require very uh, specific uh, information that I will ask uh, first Hassan to go straight to the point on those uh, issues. And then uh, Dr. Doyare will also do the same. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gigi. I have just noticed that uh, Honorable Gabekulu has raised the hand perhaps before the uh, 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 Mr. Hassan come in, let me let me give Honorable Kabekulu the opportunity to raise his question. He, he has a terrible network problem where he is in the rural areas of KZN. Uh, Honorable Kabekulu, can you hear me now? Yes, Chairperson. Yeah. Th thank you for the opportunity. Um, Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm in Cape Town. I don't have a problem with, with, with uh, the network. It's only that uh, I have a, a challenge with my, my, my laptop. That's why I, what I, I've just sent a message to the chairperson. But uh, the questions I wanted just to raise, chairperson, were very simple in, 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 in um, trying to make follow-ups on, on, on certain issues that uh, were once raised. Since uh, the main... Um, the main challenge the, the three spheres of government were, were entangled in was uh, operating in silos. Uh, I wanted just to check whether it has been uh, successfully addressed. Firstly, the second one was uh, can members, knowing that uh, a lot has been, is being said now about this DDM issue uh, on, 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 on certain uh, districts and, 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 and what for, districts and, and, and um, metros. Uh, 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 <clears throat> I want to just to, to check, Chairperson. Um, uh, can the maybe the department can, can give exact uh, municipal, municipalities where these have been uh, implemented, so that maybe one could maybe uh, for purposes of, of oversight could uh, visit and see whether exactly uh, things that are, are, are being said here are actually happening out, out there. And the the the, the other uh, issue, uh, although it's a concern, Chairperson, is that. Uh, we, we seem to be uh, seeing uh, 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 staging of events when the ministers and, 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 and MECs are, are going to, to launch these things. But uh, we do not uh, actually see when these things are, 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 are launched in, in rural areas. We don't see the traditional leadership, whereas the department uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 encompasses even the, the traditional uh, uh, um, affairs. This what the, the, the things are right just to raise, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Can can the department respond to that as well? Uh, thanks, Chairperson. Starting with the last question on the role of traditional uh, leadership, I will give uh, still the same example of what we saw in Erikwala, which is also a rural uh, area. That even on the day of the launch, we had the local uh, uh, traditional uh, leaders. We had also the chairperson of the house, of the provincial house of traditional leadership in, in case that and being part of the, the, the process. And up to what we had when the traditional leaders spoke, they did confirm that they have been part of this uh, process. And what we will need to then do between ourselves and, and, and COPTA is then to monitor the extent to which that is happening, whether it is happening in an isolated manner, as I'm just referring to one area, but then I think the point is, is noted that traditional leaders play a very big role in our communities. So we then we, we follow up on, on that. But it is based on what we have experienced as a department that is happening. And also with what we are doing in Sikukune to assist our DM to launch the area where she has been deployed, we are bringing on board the traditional leadership in, in, in that area. Now, in terms of what has happened since the launch of the, of the pilots, and I think that is uh, the, 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 the uh, gist of the, the, the question. Now, what we do have is that in the areas that, in the, the, that the, the pilot areas, a lot of work has been done in, in harmonizing the plans of the different uh, areas. That will be in Eteguini, or Tambo, and water back in, in, in the Bobo. So there we, we, we have uh, moved uh, forward in terms of the consolidation of the plans of the, of the different spheres of government. 
In the others, we still in the launch is phase. And, and, and as honorable members will remember is that the district development model start now in the middle of a financial year. So there have been just adjustments based on what the departments were already doing. But going into the new APPs, it will be a requirement that each and every department will have to show over the MTF period what will be happening in the different districts where they will be implementing a project. And as they do so, those plans, those plans will they those APPs will have to correspond with the one plan, one district a plan. So that is going to, to be done. So what we've done for this financial year, because everything happened with COVID in the middle of the financial year, we're just to align where we, we can align based on the available e resources. So this is going to be very key in the work that we're going to do. Lastly, is this, is this eliminating e silos? The answer is yes. This seeks to do exactly that because national departments will no longer go to districts and launch projects that you find that even the mayor does not even know or only get invited after the, the fact to come and cut the ribbon. Now there will be one plan that is going to be monitored and be evaluated by, by DPME. And then of course we bring the reports on those to, 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 to ourselves. And lastly, the point is that this is a new uh, approach that government has taken. Unfortunately, COVID happened in the midst of us uh, starting to implement the district development uh, model. But I wish to assure members that there is commitment throughout the uh, government to ensure that this is done and is done well uh, from the, the beginning. Thank you. I would then ask Hassan just on very specific uh, issues that I have not uh, dealt with. And then Dr. Bihar will do the same chair. We will not uh, take uh, anything more than 10 minutes just to wrap up on our answers. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Can they, can they come in? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, DG. DG has covered most of the issues, and I think he highlighted that I need to maybe just say something on the um, uh, point around um, internal audit that was raised by the Honorable Member Matsepo. So, I mean, uh, it is an extremely important question, and what we find, uh, and this, of course, is not necessarily confined to local government, is that in a uh, we have in now in the case of local government, you have what people say that the form is in place. So we don't have a problem. There, there's no issue with whether internal audit committees exist or municipal public accounts committees exist. The, the thing is that municipalities do establish them. But the value of the algemum is that it doesn't look at whether they've been established. The value of the algemum is to see to what extent they're fulfilling their role. And that's where the problem is. So generally municipalities um, uh, have internal audit committees, but they don't fulfill their function according to the requirements. And that sort of affects the way in which uh, in audit improvement plans get uh, uh, attention or serious attention and 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 uh, are implemented properly, and whether internal controls are strengthened and things like that. So that's the big, big, big issue, uh, no doubt, uh, which accounts for uh, a lot of the sort of problems that uh, uh, municipalities face in relation to uh, audit outcomes, supply chain management issues, uh, irregular tax expenditure, and so on. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any more, but the 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 I would also support uh, um, Honorable Member Lesoma's uh, uh, recommendations, and I think we should uh, in future include uh, uh, as part of our concluding parts recommendations. Uh, why that's important is because you know uh, SDPME we have a specific role. Our role is uh, you know, in a sense supportive. Uh, it's to use mechanisms, tools, and instruments to surface issues in, in government uh, performance and so on. And in the case of Algemum, that's what we do. That's what we do. 
But the Constitution says, of course, in terms of Section 154, that uh, responsibility for monitoring, supporting, and enabling uh, municipalities to um, fulfill their duties and mandates and functions rests with the provincial and national departments of local government. So unless that inter local government intergovernmental system is not properly operational and fulfills that, that role, uh, you know, the support to municipalities, uh, uh, proper monitoring of their municipalities and uh, targeted interventions uh, will not happen. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I will ask Dr. Biari to quickly deal with issues, particularly those related to the presidential hotline, including the question that the Honorable Malazi asked on the time frames of the pilot project. Okay, can you thank come you, in? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, DG, for, for that. Uh, well, firstly, I want to say that we have to, we have to look at the context in which uh, we were working uh, in government. And I think it's important to remember that we were under a disaster management. We were following uh, crisis management and disaster management principles in at this time of lockdown. Also, uh, you know, call centers were being developed and, uh, you know, they were being set up to be responsive, to, to actually adapt and be responsive specifically to a COVID environment, specifically uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, our social relief packages and uh, our, you know, some of the announcements made by the president. So it's important to understand it in the context. Also, uh, you know, we had changing regulations and this was, you know, we had to actually ensure that the call center agents were also empowered to keep up with the pace of the changing regula regulations in that they give, uh, you know, important, they give that they were able to give proper uh, direction or information to citizens. So th that that's where, you know, we have to understand that in context because crisis management and disaster management is a discipline in its own. Now, with regard to the, the Gauteng one, we do also, uh, you know, uh, a principle of crisis, uh, crisis management is decisive decision-making. So it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, uh, how they actually did their thing, uh, you know, is also important to keep that in perspective. But I also want to say that part of our hotline roles and responsibilities, we also do provide support to uh, provinces. So we would actually be providing support and looking into the, the Gauteng resolution rate. I can assure the committee that that will be done and that that is part of the value chain of the work that the presidential hotline uh, does. And I also want to say that the presidential hotline is only one tool of the frontline service delivery monitoring uh, aspects. And we are also monitoring all the provinces from uh, on, on, the COVID, uh, on the COVID response from a public sector monitoring view so we look at all these as a package in making improvements or recommendations to a province, to all the provinces as well. So, so definitely we will be providing support to all the provinces in how, how uh, COVID issues were dealt with. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, whether we, was, we report to com uh, communities, definitely, as I said, that our community, uh, uh, the presidential hotline is only one tool of an integrated frontline service delivery monitoring uh, set of tools. And we would actually, we do, uh, based on our, our findings, we do actually work with communities. For example, in that issue of the PTO in the, in the Ziani uh, area, when we were looking at it, we actually had to engage in communities as well 
in that we uh, that we know this wasn't only for the group that actually came to us at the union buildings, but there are other groups in that community. But because of lockdown, we couldn't actually pursue it. And we do have an, uh, specifically a community-based monitoring arm as well, where we're finding that we have to actually, uh, you know, uh, see it as a value chain of how we actually do it. And also in how we monitor the, uh, the, COVID, uh, the DDM in terms of the DDM, how we integrate the monitoring of and feedback to communities through our community-based monitoring, and that actually includes governance structures, such as ward committees as well, because that was actually one of the questions. But admittedly, at the present, we are also uh, you know, learning, and definitely we have to strengthen community uh, feedback to communities. In terms of the trends, uh, in terms of the presidential hotline resu results, I would say that uh, the, uh, that is well taken. Definitely, we have to look at trends. But in terms specifically of the COVID responses, we uh, it will we will be uh, measuring apples with oranges because we had to actually adapt our systems. We had to be quickly responsive to actually uh, respond to our specifically on COVID related issues. But but it's well taken and we will definitely try and do some correlations and dig further into those, uh, you know, those aspects uh, as well. In terms of practical examples, we do, uh, you know, have a communica communications is part of our, 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 our whole value chain of our improvements as well. But I think one, one of the lessons learned from COVID was that we also need to work with the government, with the GCIS as well. As I had said earlier, that me being in the, in the uh, community uh, engagement and communications uh, NAT joint, definitely we see that that, that, is, that was definitely a lesson learned, that from a presidential hotline, that link is very important as well. So because we can't, it's easier to actually resolve issues, many of the complaints we get are information and it's easier to, to respond to issues from a higher uh, platform. We do, in terms of the citizens, we do also get uh, measure the impact, well, not impact, but um, the outcomes of the presidential hotline resolutions in that we have a citizen satisfaction survey that is administered to uh, citizens. But once again, uh, you know, in our in, uh, working together, in our integration uh, with the DDM, we would also keep that in mind. Uh, in terms of the Kawalisa app, uh, in terms of the Kawalisa app, we are actually uh, going to be, it's going to be reviewed after three months. Uh, the pilot is going to be reviewed, but we are also ensuring that it's based like the, the review process is really, uh, you know, based on the principles of science so that we can make evidence-based uh, decisions on the way forward. And it's also important to say that we also will be tracking the change management because change management of staff is also important in terms of the use of technology. And we want to be absolutely sure that our own presidential hotline staff uh, and the call center are actually taken through a process of change management. And that would be one of the KPIs that will be also monitored uh, in, in, uh, in the review as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we now get uh, Costa presentation? I don't see the 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 minister. I mean the the deputy minister in. I don't know who is going to do the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good morning to to all the honourable members, uh, to the DG and the colleagues from uh, DPME. Uh, Chair, my my name is Temba Fosi. 
uh, I'm the GDG in court uh, responsible for local government support, also uh, coordination of the, the rollout of the GTM uh, project. Uh, that I don't see the deputy minister uh, in the in the uh, group, but uh, I see the officials from the deputy minister here. I'm not sure if he's connected through them. Uh, but uh, we we many of the questions that have already been asked uh, on the DDM. Uh, I think the the DG has has covered many of them, uh, but in the presentation we will also try uh, and, and respond to, to those questions. Uh, I will request, Chair, that the, the Secretary, they can uh, flight the, the, the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much. If we can move to, to, to the next slide. Uh, the next slide. Thanks, uh, Chair. Th this slide we we just reflecting uh, on the the context of of the the worst pandemic that we are dealing with as a country now, uh, and the impact it has had uh, on the country uh, to an extent of also exposing some of the fault lines uh, that were, were were faced with as a country in terms of increased levels of poverty, hunger, and unemployment but also exposing the digital divide uh, between the, the first and the second sort of uh, economy, if you like. Uh, however, Chair, uh, the pandemic has also demonstrated uh, how government uh, can be agile and work in a more responsive and coherent and integrated way uh, in terms of how we have responded as government overall to, to the pandemic, uh, including improving some of the systems uh, uh, around technology in terms of uh, quick decision making processes. Uh, next slide. We can move to the next slide. Uh, uh, and then also, Chair, I think what, what the pandemic has, uh, if you move, yes, the next slide. If you look at this slide, what the pandemic, the lessons uh, in how government uh, is responding, but also the impact of COVID. It has demonstrated that we we, we really need uh, new thinking uh, and, and and consider radical approaches to how we we, we deal fundamentally with some of the perennial problems uh, that we are faced with in terms of transforming the ownership patterns in terms of the economy to ensure expansion of assets uh, access to land and finance uh, look at how we strengthen social safety nets uh, to build resilient sort of uh, South Africa but also unlocking value chains of production and service delivery to ensure that more mass-based economic participation is, is actually realized and, and strengthening the, the uh, local economic development uh, through implementation of the district model. What is important with the next slide, Chair, uh, is to look at uh, the, the, the whole district development model, uh, that it's, it's not another new program or project. It is predicated on the constitutional provisions uh, and the responsibilities and obligations that we have as the three spheres. So if you look at uh, going back to, to the RDP, some of the policy documents that, that have informed policy of government, you look at the white paper on local government and some of the critical sort of uh, constitutional sections uh, in terms of the, the, the objects of local government uh, and the emphasis being on effective provision of services, but also promoting social and economic development, uh, providing basic needs of the people and creating jobs, uh, basic services, which will include also issues of uh, housing, water, electricity, and so on. Uh, even the uh, section uh, 153 in terms of the developmental duties of local government. Uh, there's an emphasis again there around uh, providing uh, basic needs and promoting social and economic development. The critical one, Chair, which I think uh, speaks uh, to, to the role of this new approach is the role in terms of Section 154 of the Constitution, where both national and provincial governments have an obligation to support and strengthen the capacity of municipalities uh, 
to manage their own functions and responsibilities. So, so if you take that section 154 and, and the chapter three of the constitution in terms of cooperative governance and, and the IGR, whilst we have distinct spheres, we have an obligation to provide an integrated and a coherent government for the Republic. And, and the principles of cooperative governance must then inform how we work and, and what the district development model, it provides then that uh, approach of how the three spheres can operationalize in a more programmatic way where these three spheres in a targeted and coherent way will work together. The success of, of the district development model it is, of course, dependent on uh, uh, creating functional municipalities, effective municipalities with the right expertise and systems uh, to drive uh, their developmental uh, responsibilities. Looking at those areas in terms of good governance, ensuring the sound financial management, and also ethical and effective leadership, uh, and then putting proper systems for delivery of uh, services and infrastructure and creating these vibrant uh, communities. I'll, I'll, I'll ask that you, you move to the next slide. We can skip this one. Uh, I mean, this is just uh, an emphasis on some of the, the, the policy principles. The, if you move to the slide six on the objects uh, of, of the district model, uh, and then these are the objectives chair that were adopted by cabinet when they adopted this uh, uh, approach that uh, this model is meant to really solve the silos, uh, the duplication and fragmentation in how the three spheres work. And narrow the distance between the people, uh, ensure that we deliver integrated services. But also more importantly, we, we, we look at uh, inclusive and gender responsive budgeting uh, that responds to, to the needs of, of, of uh, communities and our people and target the, the challenges uh, of, of youth uh, uh, unemployment, uh, which is a big challenge that we're faced as a country. Uh, ensure that we, we inculcate the, the long range planning in the whole system. We have a national development plan that sets out the long term vision and goals for the country. Those goals must be translated and broken down into specific targets that can be achieved in the 52 spaces, which is your 44 districts and the, and the eight metros. This slide just, we, we look at how some of the lessons uh, on how the other countries have, have uh, uh, approached the issue of long-term planning uh, and look at the Chinese model here. And take a look at this, to look at their endowment structure in terms of what does it have, uh, the different district, what do they have, what are their comparative advantages, and, and what sort of uh, industrial structure do you need to, to facilitate and promote to ensure that you are then able to, to structurally address some of the structural uh, transformation issues. And if you move to, to the next slide, we, the next slide, we few slides, we, we're just sharing a, a case study on, on OR Tambo, uh, uh, just to, 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 to emphasize the point uh, about the importance of this uh, long-term uh, planning and then also the three spheres focused in a targeted way to address the developmental needs and opportunities. So if you look at OR Tambo, whilst OR Tambo, it's one of the top 10 poorest districts in the country. Uh, the paradox is that uh, OR Tambo, it, it's one of the poorest, but it's actually also a very rich uh, district. If you look at the untapped potential uh, of that district in terms of uh, agriculture, uh, tourism, and the ocean's economy. Uh, if you look at the next slide, uh, the next slide then gives you some of, of the, 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 the opportunities, uh, untapped opportunities uh, that are there. Uh, we're just reflecting in that slide that uh, Minister Senzum Tun is the, the champion uh, uh, deployed to, to this district. And if we are to reimagine our time, we need to look at then uh, what are some of the sort of uh, key economic drivers uh, and, and uh, that can uh, un, uh, uh, transform and unlock the opportunities that are in this district? And they would range from, from issues of uh, agriculture, uh, opportunities, agro-processing, look at the blue oceans economy, the fisheries, forestry manufacturing, and tourism. 
and all the locals in Oaktambo will have uh, specific comparative advantages in terms of uh, endowment around these, these uh, opportunities. And then we must also look at then that, that district as a whole in terms of the long term. And, and this is uh, another area in terms of the key to unlocking the potential of, of this district. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, the whole Wild Coast corridor, which, which is actually the, the critical sort of uh, opportunity that can bring, uh, that connect firstly or Tambo with the neighboring uh, Alfred and Zod district, but also with uh, uh, Amatole in terms of the, the, the Wild Coast sort of corridor. And then it links up with the, all the different sort of uh, opportunities that are there uh, and the locals uh, in, in, in that district. So investing in that uh, uh, Wild Coast corridor will unlock a, a lot of opportunities uh, in that district. And of course, Oar Tambo is known for, for uh, as a sending, uh, uh, labor sending district in terms of mining uh, we can move to the next slide. I've already made this point. It's known as a labor sending sort of district in terms of uh, to KZN, Northwest, and, and, and uh, uh, Gauteng sort of economy. So there is also a link uh, with those uh, districts. And when, when we plan for a long-term plan and unlocking opportunities of our time, we must also look at those sort of uh, uh, linkages with, with the other, uh, either neighboring districts or other provinces. The, the next slide, uh, we, we're trying then to, to reflect here uh, in terms of the institutional uh, uh, mechanisms that have been established. Uh, the DG has already spoken to the issue of the champions, uh, and those champions uh, will be supported by, by uh, COCTA working with the other uh, key departments, DPME, National Treasury, uh, and also other critical sectors that have a footprint in that district. But we have also established a hub which will be uh, support sitting outside of the district, acting as a central point of coordination to ensure that all the district, when they come to that district, they are coordinated at one central point in relation to how they support the one plan process. So the DG made the point that uh, we are avoiding situation where the national department parachutes projects to that district. But there's one plan for that district and all departments are integrated and aligned to how they contribute to, to that one plan. So the one plan, it's, a, it's an expression of clear budget commitments and investments and programs of national and provincial government, including the, the municipalities themselves in terms of what are the priority areas uh, that are going to be funded uh, to unlock uh, opportunities in terms of driving the economy of that area, but also what are the opportunities uh, at, a, at a community level that unlocks economic activities to empower uh, child and, and women-headed household, uh, the unemployed youth, but also how do we respond to the infrastructure uh, need uh, of, of, of that district based on a clear long-term uh, infrastructure plan, uh, economic recovery plan, uh, and the financial uh, sustainability plan of that municipality. In addition to, to the hub, uh, Chair, we're also uh, uh, looking at uh, establishing these uh, municipal shared uh, support services, which will be uh, uh, a group of uh, 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 experts that will be deployed to provide hands-on support uh, in the municipalities. And that hands-on support, it will be based on a, a, a comprehensive institutional capacity assessment uh, done on the state of those municipalities in terms of what are the challenges in financial management, uh, in terms of infrastructure, on governance. So, so that assessment gives us, a, in, in the same way as we have a profile of that district, but we also know what is the state of the municipalities how have they been performing in terms of audit outcome? What are the challenges that they have? Uh, if they don't have skills or infrastructure, we then uh, assist with, with, with provision of uh, support around the uh, infrastructure planning uh, or financial management and so on. 
the, 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 the next slide in terms of just progress on, on, on some of the work that has been done, uh, just the clear sort of roadmap. So the, 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 the pilot projects were launched uh, late last year. Uh, the cabinet approved the, 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 the model in August. Uh, we started launching in uh, Oar Tambo, Waterbeck and Tewini. Uh, we have appointed uh, the hub in Waterbeck and uh, 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 Oar Tambo. Uh, they are currently now uh, developing an action plan and they've started the process on the one plan with, with those, uh, the district and we're interacting with the various uh, stakeholders even outside of government to look at uh, how business, uh, how some of the co critical community organization, uh, academic institution can also support uh, the process of developing uh, uh, this one plan. We, we do have uh, profiles of all the 52 district municipalities. These profiles chair, are important set uh, of, of analysis that must guide how national and provincial government respond to, to the needs and opportunities of, of each district. So the profiles are comprehensive. They give you sort of a comprehensive state of development of that district, looking at the levels of poverty, uh, unemployment, performance of the economy, which are the key sectors, uh, also social challenges in terms of uh, child and woman headed household, the health status of the district, crime, uh, the state of the infrastructure. So it's a comprehensive profile that gives you a, a good set, uh, uh, idea of what is the extent of the problem in each district. And, and our view is that those profiles must then inform the plan in the other uh, 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 spheres, uh, the provincial and the national level. And in that profile is also, as I've said, uh, complemented by a profile that looks at uh, the institutional capacity of the municipalities themselves. Uh, the champions have been appointed to, to also facilitate uh, oversight over firstly how all the three spheres are responding to COVID, but also what are some of the, 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 the impact of COVID on those municipalities and how national and provincial governments working together uh, can, can and respond to, to the impact of, of COVID but also they'll be involved in the whole facilitation of the development of this, this uh, one plan. So uh, as, as, a, as a, these are some of the progress uh, chair. So, so the champions are actively uh, visiting uh, the district. Uh, uh, currently KZN has launched uh, about 10, uh, we just left with one uh, district which will be launched uh, uh, in two weeks time. Uh, Lipompo has launched two out of the three. Uh, the champions continue to engage uh, uh, with this district, and those are some of the provinces that have been uh, visited. Uh, and we continue to, to also work with our the champions uh, to support them uh, in this visit, but also uh, producing reports out of these visits that gives us a sense of what, what are the issues that are coming out of, of, of uh, the, the outcome of these visits. If you look at the next slide, we, we begin to just reflect on some of those uh, challenges, uh, issues of service delivery issues, especially around water, uh, housing, and, and the uh, challenges of maintenance or, or of infrastructure. Uh, uh, the issue of the increasing uh, municipal debt uh, and the ability of some of the municipalities to collect uh, and, and the impact of, of, uh, of COVID uh, in terms of now all spheres continuing to, to encourage our people uh, to, to uh, comply with the regulations on COVID in terms of wearing of masks, uh, prohibition of large gatherings and, and issues of social distancing. Uh, we, we do have some challenges, but uh, we are working uh, with, with the, the champions in terms of uh, ensuring that they're able to report back uh, and the National Disaster Management Center is the sort of central point of coordination the work of the champions uh, and some of the champions have gone directly to, to the district this is my last slide chair just to indicate the the point that was raised by the dj we we have met with dpme treasury uh, as culture 
to develop uh, guidelines that must inform the planning uh, and the budgeting process. Firstly, to ensure that uh, APPs that will be developed in the 2021 are aligned to the district development model approach, but the budget guidelines also uh, incorporate the spatial uh, budgeting principles uh, to ensure that uh, every investment that government spends, it can actually be geo-referenced to a specific uh, area, but also with clear sort of uh, uh, commitment and intention of how is it responding to the challenges of, of that area. The one plan process has con uh, started in the, in, the, in the three pilots. The coordinating structures have been established, and I agree with the DG, that these structures are not replacing or introducing any uh, new structures. We're building on the structures that already are provided by the constitution, but these are more uh, structures for coordination, for en enhancing coordination uh, across and within the, the, the three spheres. The, the local government stabilization program, this is a program that we, we will actually be looking at how in a more targeted uh, way we, we deal with some of the, the perennial problems that the, the, the honorable members have raised, whether it's in terms of skills shortages, uh, poor performance in terms of finances, uh, the issue of infrastructure, how we plan, uh, there are quite a number of uncompleted uh, projects. How do we inculcate a new sort of planning uh, paradigm and discipline uh, in, in addressing infrastructure needs? Uh, we, we are establishing uh, an IMS uh, information management system uh, that is going to ensure that we have a repository of all of these uh, one plans, uh, uh, the profiles, but also what each department is actually investing and committing to do in each of the districts. And that will also be used as a monitoring tool, working with DPME uh, systems uh, to ensure that there's one coherent monitoring tool for, for, for government that gives us a, a good sort of insight of how government is spending uh, and what is it uh, committing in terms of budgets uh, with clear timelines and milestones uh, that will give us a, a good sense of uh, how as a country overall we're, we're, we're working on this. The last point about the regulatory framework, we, we want to also chair anchor this uh, in the legislation. So section 47 of the IGR Act provides for the minister to regulate the alignment of plans across the three spheres. And the one plan, it's one sort of uh, 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 provision uh, that can be uh, regulated through that act. But also the IGR Act provides uh, for protocols, IGR protocols, which will express clear commitments of the three spheres. So we will utilize those tools that are already provided for in the IGR Act. But we will work with the, the other departments to ensure that we, we look at uh, how we rationalize uh, the, the many planning uh, instruments across government. Um, but this is the beginning of the process uh, and we're looking at, uh, as the process evolves, we, we, we look at how we strengthen uh, even the issues of consolidation of the grants so that we're all focused on uh, in a targeted way to addressing uh, some of the challenges. Uh, and this process will be aligned uh, to some of the critical interventions that are driven at a national level. Uh, the infrastructure, the SIPs through the infrastructure that have been gazetted, that are led by the president. Uh, how are those linked to the human settlement catalytic projects? And how all of these projects uh, are expressed a fine expression in the plans of the different district municipalities uh, and, and look at all of these in one plan so that you don't have multiplicity of plans and, 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 uh, and processes across government, but government works in a coherent and targeted way to change the conditions of, of this district. Uh, there has been a good traction, Chair. Uh, we have interacted uh, with uh, the provinces, uh, the district, uh, and uh, we've consulted even stakeholders outside of government. Uh, traditional leaders uh, have been consulted as part of this process. And as we visit the districts, we interact with all the stakeholders 
from traditional leaders, faith-based organization, business, uh, to ensure that uh, the, the one plans uh, uh, are inclusive, but also express uh, a shared vision uh, for, for this district, which all the stakeholders can, can own up and commit to. Thank you very much, uh, Jefferson. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable members. Can I can I note hands? Can the members raise hands on the platform so that I note all of them at once? two so far. Can Honorable Soma come in? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I, I think there's not much one will say because also it tend to have overlapped with DTM presentation in a way. Having said that, let's appreciate the, the, the municipal mapping as it were, uh, which does assist in terms of appreciating and understanding the opportunities that various districts has within the country. If I may ask Chair, uh, there is the 20, 2030 vision, uh, subject to correction, we are left with 10 years. But the way the presentation talks to it's like, uh, I hope it's not like that, but it sounded like you are starting all over again. We have just discovered South Africa. That could be my limitation. But also what is good then, it does from the NDP uh, document, talks to for me in chapter four, in chapter four and six, to chapter four and six, um, which then talks to the envisaged future of South Africa, the way we, over, we, 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 we see it moving forward. But also what has been presented, Chair, it won't be realized from where I'm seated. If then we don't go and closely revisit the systems and strengthen them, as per the AG's uh, uh, pronouncement recently in terms of the weak system that also allows negative opportunistic behaviors and tendencies within the public sector. Because all what has been presented, if we don't have a, a, a properly a standing governance structures as it were and the systems, the private sector would not necessarily have a buy-in noting that the fiscal of, of, of government also is shrinking. So I'm saying that we must also look at that. And I know that is not the responsibility squarely of uh, Hocter, but DPSA and related bodies also needs to look at that so that they can support the, the, the last program or plan that has been presented that can give us a hope economically and socially speaking. But also I might have omitted uh, for now from this plan, are we going to get an annex of a plan that will talk now to how do we then move forward in terms of realizing the plan that has been presented with the clear time frames? Because among other things that as public representatives is to measure performance. And if there are no clear time frames, would not necessarily be able to, to, to measure it. Hence, I make reference to 2030, which you are left with 10 years. Other than that, one is encouraged and expired, chain with the good work thus far. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Shreba. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Good morning. Uh, Chair, I have a couple of concerns that I'd like to raise uh, specifically on this uh, district development model. The first one is I'd like to ask the department to show me where the uh, district of Awar Tambo ever elected Minister Senzo Mtunu as their so-called champion. What exactly is the legal basis for 
so-called deployment of someone who is elected at the national level of government to go and be a champion, quote unquote, at a local government level. Chair, I really am very concerned about this. It, it, there's no basis in our constitutional democracy for deploying someone to go and interfere in the affairs of a, of a democratically elected local government. And I'd go so far as to say that I'm concerned that it is tantamount to a coup to go and interfere in the, in the affairs and operations of municipalities. I think there's a danger here that we have, or that the department and the government is, is willfully misdiagnosing the problem. We've seen in South Africa that municipalities can work. There are municipalities in South Africa that work. They don't have to be centralized and have local democracy be undermined through this kind of thing. We've seen that many municipalities in the Western Cape and other DA-run municipalities like Midval are working very effectively without this kind of central state interference. The reality is that we have a political problem in these municipalities, a political problem which sees corrupt people being re-elected time after time to just keep uh, destroying and undermining governance in these municipalities. It is a political problem that requires a political solution and trying to deflect from that political reality by, uh, by uh, making it seem like decentralization or federalism or subsidiarity is the problem, I think is extremely disingenuous. And I think the government and the department must be well aware that they are not going to just get away with what appears to be in many ways tantamount to a coup here by deploying people to interfere in municipalities who have absolutely no constitutional mandate to do so. Thank you, Chair. Well, can I get responses from the department? Chairperson. Uh, okay, wait a bit. Uh, I see that uh, Honorable Mosepe. Okay. Come in, or uh, Thank you very much, Chairperson. I would like to welcome the presentation and the presenter as well. I've got only two questions here. Is the district development model has the potential to reduce duplication, wastage, and corruption across the three spheres of government? Question one. Number two is with two directors responsible for the monitoring provinces, the department has, does the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation need more capacity to monitor provinces? Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Can we, can I get responses to the question raised so far and comment also? You, you are free to comment to, on comment. Okay. No, thank, thank, thanks very much, Chair, Chairperson. Uh, I think the, the first question from the Honorable Member, uh, the Soma, the, the part of the, the problem that we are trying to address with this uh, uh, approach is to actually, when you talk about addressing the silos, uh, duplication and fragmentation in how the three spheres are working, what you have currently, you have plans of national government, you have plans of provinces, you have plans of the municipalities themselves. Uh, so there's IDPs, SDPs, uh, provincial government will have its own uh, APPs, but also their provincial growth and development plan. Uh, national, you'll have various, uh, so there's the NDP, which is meant to be uh, sort of all the, the APPs and the plans of these departments are meant to actually uh, translate that NTP into implementable targets. But the reality is that uh, in practice, uh, all of these plans uh, are not integrated uh, and, and they come at a municipal level uh, in varied uh, uh, way, uh, but not in a coherent way. Uh, let, let me give you some of the examples that uh, with the, the lessons that we've learned in, uh, in Oartam. When we went to Oartam, it was we also asked uh, national and provincial departments to give us their budget and program. So, so one of the examples, we looked at, uh, there were about uh, five departments 
that that are providing training uh, targeting the youth. But all of these programs, the focus was really more around you know, certification of the youth without really providing uh, sustainable skills development and opportunities beyond training. And if, if you are talking about an integrated way, all of these departments with a budget of over 100 million, if we're working on one plan, targeting the youth of our term, we can actually provide, provide, the DDM provides us with an opportunity then to say, how do we work together? to address that problem. There were schools that were, were, were identified where schools are built in areas where there's no sort of uh, pupils uh, or learners, uh, and which is a problem in terms of how we plan. Uh, but but there's the issue of working in silos, uh, not talking together uh, in how we respond. So, so the issue of the 10 years, the idea behind a long-term plan is to have a long-term plan that is 30 or 25 years that can then be broken down into five-year electoral terms, but with clear commitments of how you, you, you then, what are the building blocks towards achieving that long-term. And one of the areas we want to look at uh, is to ensure that this long-term plan is actually protected in legislation so that every five-year administration that comes on board they don't change the priorities or that long-term plan, uh, but they must actually focus on their contribution to achieving that long-term plan. In that way, we're able then to measure how the NDP uh, is actually being implemented in the various uh, district spaces based on the, the same sort of uh, targets that, that everyone is, is clear about. The, the, the point that I've raised, uh, I mean, I agree with the, uh, the honorable member around uh, first strengthening the weak systems, which is the point that uh, the success of the DDM is also dependent on functional and professional uh, and sustainable municipalities that have good governance uh, processes, effective and, and, and ethical leadership, but there's sound man financial management, uh, there's capacity and skills for delivering infrastructure uh, and responding to service delivery. So the, 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 the point about the hub and, and this shared uh, municipal support uh, is to have a targeted approach on how we, we integrate capacity building programs across the three sphere. So that as it relates to a particular district, everyone who's providing capacity building program or there are grants targeted on capacity building they are coordinated in one point and is targeted in terms of what do we want to improve based on the assessment that is done of that district. Currently, capacity building, many sectors have capacity building and they're going to those districts, providing all sorts of training, but it's not coordinated and not integrated. And now with this approach, we, it gives us one uh, 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 sort of uh, one plan that can be we can deal with the developmental issues, but also deal with the building and, and professionalizing uh, these institutions. Chair, Chair, the, the, I think the second question, <clears throat> the, the honorable member, the, the DDM, as I've indicated, uh, it, it, it's not, it's predicated on the constitutional provision. Uh, the, the, the strengthening coordination across the three spheres is an intergovernmental responsibility of all the three spheres. And it's not a centralization of, of power at national level. The, the champions that uh, we're talking about here, these are not champions that are going to be taking over functions of municipalities, but they are meant to ensure that uh, they assist in unlocking some of the misalignment, intergovernmental misalignment. Let, let me give you an example. Etewin, including some of the Western Cape municipalities that are doing well, one of the problems that they have, you don't have a firm commitment of how national government or sector departments are contributing to, 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 to those plans of municipalities. And strengthening the, the coordination across and within the three sphere, the, the champion's work is to actually assist in unlocking. So if when we went to Etewin, one of the problems that we identified was the issue of the harbor uh, in Etewin. And the municipality, the city could not address that problem. It required 
uh, Department of DPA, it required uh, Transnet to come on board and work with the city to address that problem. And now there's a team, intergovernmental team, and the champions in Etegwin are working with national departments, the province, and the city to address that problem. So it's not about taking over functions. The champions is not their role to take over any function, but it's to ensure that they facilitate intergovernmental cooperation and collaboration across the three spheres, unlock challenges, but do oversight in ensuring that the three spheres are focused on achieving the constitutional cooperative governance principle of the three spheres working collaboratively to, to, to achieve the developmental goals of the country. And it's not, it's not uh, there's no provision or legislation that says we must provide for champions, but your cooperative governance responsibilities and the IGR structures that exist ensures that uh, the champions work with the provinces, they work with municipalities, and they're able to bring critical sectors from national that can assist those municipalities. And, and that's the overall objectives of these champions is not to take over or centralizing any power at national level, but is to ensure that commitments of, let me give you another example. When IDPs were conceptualized, they were meant to be an instrument that brings all of government in local government space. But the reality is that from practice, the past 25, the past 25 years, national sector departments have not been participating in IDP processes. And this approach, it says, who must then, <clears throat> these champions must assist in facilitating those processes to ensure that those critical national sector departments, they are part, there's clear commitment in responding to, to the needs uh, at a local level. So it is an, uh, an intergovernmental uh, obligation for the three spheres to work together. And these champions are really meant to enhance those constitutional provisions, uh, not centralizing any power. And the, the, the last question, whether do we have uh, the DDM as the potential to reduce duplication, uh, corruption. The idea of the one plan <clears throat> is to ensure that uh, it's an instrument that, that can express. So there's no department that is implementing in a, but, but let me start by saying local government is the only space where all three spheres implement. So national government has a responsibility to, to, to clearly indicate what contribution are they making in a particular space, which is why we're emphasizing the issue of special budget. Uh, and then the province must do the same. If then we have one plan that expresses all of government's commitment, including private sector, SOEs, and, and all the stakeholders, that one plan, it's a one plan that is going to be measured because it's based on the budgets and clear budget commitments and programs of support that each department, each sphere is committing to, to that district. It also introduces issues of accountability because if each department has made commitment, we're able then through monitoring of this one plan, we're able to see which sector department, which sphere is not playing its part in the achievement of those commitments that are there. Uh, and because now this one plan is not a local government plan, it's a plan of all of the three spheres. We're able to hold each other accountable because there's clear commitments that have been made in the one plan. Uh, we can hold a, a, each other accountable to the commitments that have been made uh, in, in the one plan. And, and I think uh, Chair, just to emphasize the point, uh, we're not really misdiagnosing the problem uh, we know what the state of development of the, the, the various municipalities, including municipalities that are dysfunctional, including municipalities that are performing well, uh, and how do we support them uh, to ensure that uh, they're able then to, to deal with uh, uh, some of the, the problems. Uh, and then the, the, the DDM provides us with an, with an opportunity now not to, to, to deal with political problems, I mean, I'm not a politician, but the political problem will be resolved at the political level. But through this approach, we're able to build systems, we're able to professionalize local government, ensure that the competency requirements are met by all municipalities. We employ the right people with the right skills, uh, and we support municipalities that are struggling uh, in terms of attracting 
uh, scales in the in the particularly your rural uh, municipality. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the person. Uh, let me thank both the department, COCTA and DPME, for for their presentation to the portfolio committee, and once again also uh, thank the honorable members for availing themselves for this uh, portfolio committee meeting. Thank you very much, all of you. The meeting stands adjourned now. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Dada.